Well, here we are, the first Sunday of 2016. It's kind of hard to believe that uh, 2015 has already passed. Seems like it just uh, it was yesterday or a couple days ago, you know, uh, 2015. And it was, of course, but uh, the year went very fast, at least for me. I, I think uh, it was hard for me to actually comprehend how quickly 2015 seemed to go by. But with 2016, the beginning of a new year, uh, I know that there are many people here that um, had last year the worst year of their lives, just for various reasons. I've heard those stories, at least many of them, and it's been a great and dramatic struggle, 2015, and many of you are happy to see it gone. And for others, it was one of the best years of your lives. It was a great year of celebration. And probably for most of us, it was somewhere in between. There were highs and lows. That's just the way that life goes, I think, that we are all on a roller coaster at times. And sometimes the waves are a little smoother and sometimes they're greater and crazy and all of those things. But the good news about a new year is it gives us a moment to stop and reflect and breathe and hopefully see that there's a new year full of all kinds of new possibilities and opportunities for us. And so no matter what our circumstances are now, that doesn't mean that they're always going to be that way. And so despite the craziness of life, and despite all the craziness in our world, and we live in a world full of craziness right now. Do you agree with that? It feels like the world is just on fire around us. Uh, It's, in fact, one of those things that I think I've chosen just not to watch the news anymore because it creates anxiety for me these days. But even though with all of the craziness around us, We get to begin again, and this is what we get to do together, and we start it this way. And so most likely, as long as Jesus doesn't return in 2016, which personally I would be thrilled if he chose to make that the return uh, in 2016, but if he does not, most of us anyway are going to get to probably experience 12 months, 52 weeks, 365 days, 8,760 hours, and then 525 1,600 minutes, although it's leap year, so there's a few more, but I didn't calculate that in my head. So here we are, you know, an extra day. And so we get to experience those minutes all that time, 525,600 minutes. The question is, what will you do with them? What will you do with this time that is now beginning, that we get to come into this place and begin anew? What will we do with this time? Individually, what will we do with that time? And what will we do as a church? What are we going to do with it? If it was a gift that God gives us, another year to live, another opportunity to come into this place and deal with those things, what will we do with it? Will we be good stewards of this time? Will we understand it and use it as a springboard to go somewhere with it? I know that many millions of people this time of year make resolutions. And maybe that was a part of your life, I don't know, but many, many, many millions of people make a resolution this time of year. And a resolution is pretty simple. It's just a course of action that you agree on, that you say, okay, I am resolved to do this. I'm going to accomplish these things. It is a fixed purpose of my life. Ultimately, a resolution is just, I'm devoted to this. I actually like that word better because resolution has, I think, sometimes lost its meaning and significance in our lives. But a devotion, this is what I am devoted to. To this year, lots of people do that. Lots of people make these resolutions. In fact, um, research would tell us that 40 to 45 percent of American adults make at least one. Now, if we were going to look at that just from a secular perspective, what do you think the number one or two uh, things are that people are resolved to do differently this year or devoted to this year? Just in the secular world, what would be the number one or two thing? Lose weight and start exercising, all right? And so we get those, maybe stop smoking, stop drinking, maybe get our finances in order, get out of debt, clean the garage or whatever, those kinds of things. We make, oh, I saw some elbows. That was cute. I love that. It's great. So, you know, second service, every chair was taken, so I didn't see the elbows, but yeah, it was good. That was right. You know, so we get to do those things. We resolve that way. But how about in our spiritual lives? What would they be? Probably some of the same things, but in our spiritual lives, what are some of the things we would be resolved to accomplish or devoted to do anybody read your bible pray more be consistent with church attendance to give on a better frequency or to work toward that tithe like travis was talking about those are the kinds of things that research tells us that people of faith people of belief these are the things that they tend to resolve themselves to to work on it and i will tell you that most of the time we abandon these resolutions within 30 days Right? This is what research tells us. It usually 
30 days is the max. And I have to say, I have failed at more of these than I have succeeded at in my lifetime on those resolutions. I would be ashamed to make a list of all the failed resolutions in my life. And I'm guessing I'm not alone in that. Can I get an amen? Amen. Okay, that's good. And so all of those things we have struggles with. How about this one? Anyone here want to admit that on the third day of January, you've already blown one of your resolutions. Anybody? All right, that's good. I'm proud of you. The rest of you liars, you know, come in alignment on this. No, I'm just kidding. And so those are those challenging things for us. Most of the time for myself, I probably can't even remember from one year to the next what I was resolved to do in the first place. They become such a backseat thing, something that we're really not resolved to do, not really devoted to do. And most of the time, it's a hopeful thing. It's a fantasy, you know, where you just go, well, it'd be sure nice if these things in my life were different and that kind of But that's not really a resolution. That's not a fixed purpose. That's not something that I am resolved to do and devoted to do, but we call those things resolutions all the time. So the question is, how do we actually make a real resolution, and how do we bring those into reality? Now, I'm not necessarily talking about all the secular things, weight loss and all that. I'm talking about the spiritual things. How can we be resolved to do something different in our spiritual life and actually make that a reality? How can we grow into this place to make those resolutions real, to make those devotions really devotions and not just a lip service thing? And does the Bible say anything about it? And the answer is, of course it does. And so where I want to take you for a few minutes is into the book of Philippians and see what Paul has to say about making our resolutions into reality. So if you have a Bible, I'd love it if you would turn there with me. We'll put it up on the screen today. Um, Here's the thing I want to say, that, and that is if the Bible reading is new to you, I want you to hear this loud and clear. Do not be ashamed um, to look up in the front couple pages where the book of Philippians would be. It's okay. Uh, I know a lot of people don't bring Bibles sometimes, and this is in all churches, because they're afraid that if they don't know where the book is that you're reading from, um, they're afraid that someone's going to notice them looking in the index because you might think they don't know what the books are. Guess what? It doesn't matter. No one here is going to judge you for that. It's okay. You can bring your Bible, look it up, open the first couple pages. You've got to start somewhere and find the book of Philippians. It's totally okay, all right? And so go to the book of Philippians. We're going to look at chapter 3 for just a few minutes together, and we're going to see what Paul has to say about making resolutions a reality. I want to start in verse 12 and read through 14, and then we'll back it up for a couple of minutes past that. And so look at verse 12. It says, not that I have already obtained it or have already become perfect. I want to stop there for a second. Based on your translation, the word perfect um, may not be in all of your translations. And my New American Standard Bible, which is what I typically use, defines that Greek word as perfect. It's really not a good word, actually. Um, What the word really should mean is to bring it full circle, um, to bring it all together, to make it complete is really what that Greek word would have initially meant because, again, the Bible was not originally written in English. And so when Paul said this, this is what he was thinking. And so if we read it that way, then he would basically say, not that I have already obtained it or have already already reached my goal. That would be a good way to read it. So not that I've obtained it, I haven't already reached my goal, but I press on so that I may lay hold of that for which also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Verse 13, brethren, I don't regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind, reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Now, in just those few verses, what you actually see is Paul gives five different things there to help us make our resolutions into a reality. I'm only going to cover two of those today. The other three I will talk about next week, but since everybody here is resolved to make consistent church attendance a thing for yourself this year, I know you'll be here next week, and you can hear the other three, right? Oh, yeah, that was pitiful. Come on now. And so, so that's hopefully the goal. So hopefully you'll be back next week and you'll hear part two of this. But part one is I want to at least talk about the first two things. And what we see with Paul is he says the first thing in helping us to make our resolutions into a reality, the things that we are devoted to, true devotions, is to frankly confess our shortcomings. And that's what he says here. Look at verse 12. It says, not that I have already obtained it or have already become perfect or have already reached my goal. I haven't. And so what is Paul saying? Paul is basically confessing, I have not yet arrived. 
I have not grown to the point that I want to be. I have, I'm not there yet. And he's not talking about fleshy things. Paul's not talking about weight loss or stop smoking or any of those things. He's talking about his life in Christ. He hasn't gotten to where he wants to be. He hasn't fully matured. He hasn't fully grown. Now, I don't know about you, but when I hear that and when I read this, it kind of blows my mind a little bit because the person that's talking is Paul. Paul is sort of like the super apostle. He is. I mean, he seems like the guy that is brilliant and knows all these things, is being led by God to do amazing things. I mean, really, his story begins, he's not a Christian in the beginning. In fact, he's a persecutor of Christians. He's a Jew, and he kind of gives his spiritual pedigree right before this, actually, in chapter 3, verse 5, 4 and 5, it starts. He says, although I myself might have confidence even in the flesh, that means his fleshy, fleshly accomplishments, I might have uh, confidence in those things. If anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I, I far more. In other words, if you're going to put confidence in what you can personally achieve, I have more to say about it than you do, is kind of what Paul is saying. And he, then he gives the explanation. Circumcised the eighth day, the nation of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, and then a persecutor of Christians. This is this guy who was on the fast track to becoming probably a high priest. He had it all together. As far as the spiritual pedigree, he had it. And then he has a literal come-to-Jesus moment on the road to Damascus. And Jesus appears to him and says, Paul, what are you doing? And his, he's blinded. And so a few days go by, the scales fall from his eyes. He realizes that Jesus is Lord in his life, needs to be. And he gets up and he's baptized. And then he eats and begins the journey to becoming the Apostle Paul. Whereas he began with Saul. And God so changed him. He needs a name change out of the deal. But this is the guy who's had this amazing conversion experience. The same guy who writes most of the New Testament. The same guy who preaches the most powerful sermons. And lives are changed and transformed. And sometimes they want to kill him. Because if you really preach the right kind of message in front of some people. They might want to kill you. And this is what Paul does. When you really tell the truth, not everybody likes that. I don't know if you knew that or not. But he goes and tells the truth, and they want him dead half the time, and try to. And they stone him and beat him, and he gets shipwrecked and bitten by snakes and all kinds of things. And yet this is the guy who has this story who says, and I haven't made it yet. I'm not where I need to be. I'm not where I want to be. I'm not satisfied with my spiritual life. I have growth that needs to still happen. Now, again, it blows my mind. Now, he explains what it is, because in verse 12 it says, not that I have already obtained it. What is it? Well, if we're good Bible students, it means we need to go backwards and look. What is he talking about? It's very dangerous to pluck one passage out and make your whole case based on that. So what is Paul saying? What is the it? Well, in verse 10, we see it. It says, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being conformed to his death, that I may know him. Verse 80 basically says the same thing. More than that, I count all things to be lost. What is he talking about? He's talking about his spiritual pedigree. All those things, I was circumcised in the eighth day, I was a Hebrew of Hebrews, I was a Pharisee, tribe of Benjamin. I have the right pedigree, I'm the super spiritual guy, the religious elite guy. And he says in verse 8, more than all of that, I count all of that as loss in view of the surpassing knowledge of Jesus. He wants to know him. The it, what Paul's saying in verse 12, not that I've already obtained it, is the knowledge of Jesus, a greater knowledge of Jesus. Now, guess what? Paul's not talking about just knowing more factoids about Jesus. He's not just saying, I want to know more about Jesus so I can do better at Bible trivia or go to Bible Bowl and compete better than everybody. That's not at all what Paul is saying. What Paul's talking about is a desire to really know Jesus. When you Again, with the original language, the people that would have heard this heard it different than when we think, well, you just know something. It means you, you know A, B, C, and D. No, what Paul is saying is that he wants to know Jesus spiritually and personally and intimately, that he wants to put all of him in Jesus and know him more. This is what Paul is talking about, that he wants to know him like this and he doesn't yet know him as well as he would hope. That he wants to grow in him and know him more. I, I will tell you, I think it's very comforting, though, to know that Paul says things like in 1 Timothy 1, 15, where he says, in fact, not only do I not know him completely and know him as well as I want to, I'm the worst of the worst that's there. 
He says in 1 Timothy 1.15 that Christ Jesus came to save sinners of whom I am foremost of all. I am the sinner of sinners. I am the worst. And again, you think about Paul's pedigree. I don't think Paul is being just self-deprecating just because he wants you to think highly of him. I don't think that at all. I don't think he's being falsely humble. I think Paul realizes that the closer he gets to Jesus, the more he realizes that in his flesh, he's not at all like Jesus, even though he wants to be. That the goal is to become more and more like Christ as we grow and develop. And I think that happens as we get older and we do mature and we wise up to who Jesus really is and who we really are. We can see, boy, I've got a long distance before I can be like him even though we're called to be like him. This is the call for us, is to be like Christ. And I think this is where Paul is. He just recognizes how far he really is, even though he's continuing to grow. And so, you know, I think what Paul says is important to us, though, because I think we have to recognize that we haven't yet arrived in order to continue to grow. We we have to realize that we're not where we're supposed to be. This isn't, again, this isn't self-deprecating. This isn't picking on ourselves needlessly. We know that we're not perfect. But I think it's important that we realize that we haven't made it to where we need to be because it's here that growth begins. It's only recognizing that we're not where we need to be that will propel us to desire to go somewhere different, to continue to grow and develop, which, by the way, was our theme here at Renew for all of 2015. The idea of 2015 was, let's grow. And that wasn't about numeric growth last year. It was about let's grow deeper and let's mature and let's grow into the people, the men and the women that God calls us to be to develop and mature that way. And by the way, just because 2015 is done doesn't mean that's not our theme anymore. We want to continue to grow. That's a lifelong journey. And so what Paul is saying in this teaches us something. that We have to realize that we haven't arrived yet because only then will we say, I want to continue to grow And continue to seek. But I think it's hard sometimes to admit that we haven't arrived. I think it's sometimes hard to be humble enough to say, I haven't made it. Now, I think we've done a good job of creating a culture here at Renew that says, you don't have to pretend like you've got it all together to come here. You don't have to pretend. You don't have to check your problems at the door and come in and smile and pretend like life's perfect. You don't have to. Uh, Now, a lot of churches you do. And you, many of you have had that experience where... Although you may be expected to be perfect, if you're not, you at least need to fake it. But that's not here. In fact, it's quite the opposite, that when you're broken, this is the perfect place to come because that's what community is for. And we work through these things together. This is why it's important to go deeper into community rather than just sit in an auditorium with a couple hundred, 300 other people. It's important to get into each other's lives because only then can we really grow and help each other on this journey because it is a journey of life. There's no question. But it's in these things, in these times, that we have to be transparent in order to continue to grow, in order to continue to develop, in order to realize that we have room to grow. And again, being honest, though, is challenging. Sometimes it's scary to think, I'm going to have to tell somebody that I don't have it all figured out. I don't have it all together. But, but Paul shows us that confessing this is the beginning of how we continue to grow. It's the beginning of how we make a resolution a reality, is knowing that we're not where we need to be. But let me also just say this about any resolution, that when we're resolved and we begin to understand this process of growth and that it's a development thing, and I, for myself even, I'm not where I want to be. I, I have a lot of room to grow and to develop, and I'm not just saying that to you because it's a nice thing to say. I really have a lot of areas in my life I need to continue to grow in. And I've said before, and I will tell you again, that I hope that on my last day alive, As I'm taking my last breath, I'm still developing and growing closer to Jesus. In fact, as I close my eyes for the last time on this side of life and open them on the next, that will be the greatest journey of learning Jesus, of to see him. But to grow to that point where I want to be there and I want to grow and to develop and become more and more like Jesus, I think this is what Paul is saying, and I want this for us and for you as well. But when we begin to realize that, yeah, we haven't probably made it to where we need to be, it helps us to get rid of all the justification that we do in our lives, where we're trying to justify why we haven't made it, or better yet, rationalize. I love the word rationalize. 
Rationalize, and you all know what that word means most likely. Rationalize means I'm going to come up with excuses for why this hasn't worked, right? And if you spell the word rationalize, I should have put it up on the screen, but the word rationalize is spelled R-A-T-I-O-N-A-L-I-Z-E. That's how you spell rationalize. But there's a better way to spell it. It's not English language spelling. It's a Spencerism, but here it is. How about we spell rationalize for what it really is, and that is R-A-T-I-O-N-A-L-I-E-S. That what rationalizing really is, is we're telling ourselves lies to make it all better. But when we realize that we haven't made it yet, and that this is a good place to start, it alleviates the need to rationalize. It alleviates the need to try and make excuses. And in fact, what happens instead is that our dissatisfaction of where we are should help us and spur us on to grow into who we're to be. But as long as we keep making excuses, we'll never grow. We'll never develop. We'll just continue to make excuses. Eh, I blew it this year. It's kind of like um, if, any, if any of you have ever been on a diet. I don't know if anyone's ever tried that before. Um, it's a terrible thing, let me just say. But, it, but it's like you go to breakfast with good intentions. You meet up, you know, you're on a diet, begin the year. You go to a breakfast place and you start out with, I'll order some poached eggs and some dry toast, wheat toast. So I'm going to eat wood and sawdust, you know, that kind of thing. And then for some reason, the waitress brings out biscuits and gravy and sausage and eggs, and you have to eat it because you'll hurt her feelings. I mean, you know, and so then when you eat that breakfast, even though you're on the diet, what do you do for lunch and dinner? Well, I blew it already. I might as well go crazy. Anybody ever diet like that? I'm just curious. Like, I've already messed it up, so I might as well continue to just do whatever I want. And this is how life goes. But it's because we rationalize that stuff and we tell ourselves lies. Well, I've already gone this far. I might as well just blow it up big time. But that's not at all what Paul is talking about. What Paul is saying is this. Recognize when you failed, but then use that as a motivation to grow and to develop and to become who you're supposed to be. That's with Paul. His dissatisfaction with his accomplishments led him to become more devoted, not less. More devoted, not less. That's the second thing we see out of the passage is Paul helps us to understand how to make our resolutions into a reality. It is to become fully devoted. Look again at verse 12. Not that I have already obtained it or have reached my goal, but I press on so that I may lay hold of that for which also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. What's Paul saying? I'm not where I want to be. I haven't made it yet, but I'm going to keep moving in that right direction. And I'm going to be devoted to the goal. I'm going to push to the goal. In fact, what he says is I'm going to press on to the goal. And again, back to the Greek. When people would have heard this for the first time, when, when this was read to the church or when Paul wrote this, what Paul was thinking, what the original hearers would have seen and heard was not the way that we think of press on. Press on just is a nice little phrase that says, yeah, just keep on going. But press on in the Greek, the way that we define it, it's an understanding that says it is an expenditure of energy and aggressiveness an action of a sprinter. That's what press on means. It's the action of a sprinter to press on, to expend every last fiber of muscle tissue to win and to win this race. That's what press on means. Of course, this is common language, really, for Paul. He says this kind of stuff all the time. He says, I'm running the race. This life of following Jesus is a marathon. It's a race, and I want to finish well. I want to finish the race. And so Paul uses these metaphors. Maybe he was a marathon runner back in his day, too, Travis. I don't know. But this is one of those things that he loves This analogy, this running the race. And when he says, yes, I haven't made it to where I want to be, but I'm going to press on. I am going to be aggressive and have energetic action like a sprinter to succeed, to finish. Paul is yearning to be devoted to Christ this way. To become more and more like Christ. That's Paul's resolution. That's his fixed purpose. That is his course of action. And let me ask you, have you ever looked at a resolution that way? Have you ever looked at a New Year's resolution as an aggressive, energetic action of a sprinter? That yes, I may have failed in the past, but I'm going to press on. I'm going to continue on. I'm going to do whatever it takes to accomplish the task. You know, it's true that most people that make resolutions break them. We already talked about that. But the research is really clear that for those that are devoted... For those that are really resolved and make a resolution 
to change something, to start something new, they're at least 10 times more likely to actually succeed than someone who never resolves to do anything. Even though often failure is there. But you know what the experts tell us? that The reason that so many people fail at keeping their resolutions is because they never thought they would win to begin with. They never thought they would succeed. They never really believed that they would succeed. They only expected to fail. And so it was never a devotion. It was just a passing fancy, a little interest, a little desire, instead of pressing on, as Paul says. So perhaps Paul has the right idea. Maybe Paul's idea of turning dissatisfaction into devotion and then pressing on despite setbacks, pressing on despite failures, maybe Paul really was on to something and really understood what it takes to make a resolution a reality. And so what? Why is this important to us? Well, a lot of you were here for Christmas uh, this year, 2015, for the four weeks of Christmas. And if you were here, you'll know that we did a series called Wonderful Life, which is why this is behind me. Last day for Christmas decorations at Renew. Uh, de Christmasification will officially occur this week. And that is a formal word here at Renew, by the way. You need to learn it, de Christmasification. And so de this is the last time for Christmas stuff. But with our Christmas series, we talked about It's a Wonderful Life, that movie that a lot of you probably watched over the holidays. And we spent four weeks trying to understand the messages out of that that help us to grow and to put a cap on that idea of growth for us for this year. But there was one part that I left out because I wanted it for today. And it was the one part where George finally realizes that life was not better without him in it. Because, of course, if you remember the movie, he, he, doesn't, want, he doesn't want to live. He actually says, I wish I had never been born. And he's given this gift to see how life would be had he never existed. And once he sees it, his conclusion is simple. His conclusion is, I want to live. I want to live. And for us, I think we need to draw the same conclusion that this year we really want to live. Not simply exist, but to live. And I think there's a significant difference Existing means we just continue to go through the motions of life. And probably, if we're honest, a lot of us just exist. But I want to live. And so this year, I want to talk about what does it mean to go beyond just existing and instead to really begin to live. And so that's our theme this year as we begin to look at that. But to begin that journey of life, to really live, it begins with, Realizing that we haven't made it yet. And it comes to being devoted to that. Being devoted to becoming men and women after God's own heart. For me, I, I want to be a man after God's own heart. And I want you to be men and women after God's own heart. That don't just simply exist. That don't simply check a box for church once a week but truly begin to live the life that he's called you to live. This is where we need to go. But again, it begins with recognizing our shortcomings and building a devotion, a fully devoted life, and other things that Paul will teach us in Philippians 3 next week as we go into it. And so where do we go with this? What do we do with all this? Well, this week um, I'm going to put something in the mail to many of you. Uh, at the beginning of last year, about this time last year, uh, we were unleashing the theme of grow, which was our theme for 2015. And one of the call to actions was we gave note cards out to anyone that was here that day. And we asked you to write on this note card how you wanted to grow this year, uh, which would have been a year ago. How you want to grow, how you want to mature in Christ. And then we asked you to put it in an envelope, seal the envelope, put your address on it. And we told you we'd mail it to you at the end of the year. Well, you're going to get those back this week. Now, uh, a lot of you didn't do it, partly because we've grown a lot with new people since that time. And a lot of you were not here. You weren't part of Renew in those days. Uh, others were just not here for whatever reason, traveling or sick or whatnot. But if you weren't here, here's what I'm going to ask you to do. To really spend some time thinking about how, did I, how have I grown in the last year? Have I grown in Christ? Have I matured? 
Have I spiritually developed in Christ in the last year? Or how has it gone? Has it not gone well? Or how has it gone? And then for those of you that get the card from me in the mail this week, I'm not going to say anything about it on the envelope. We didn't actually open the envelopes and look at them. I have no idea what they said. At least I didn't. I don't know about other people in the office. But I did not look at them. But I will tell you what we did every week and every time we had staff meeting and just about every time I was in the office, we took this wicker basket full of all of these cards and we prayed over them for you. And we begged God to give you the growth that you were asking for to move in your hearts, to remind you of these things and that you would take it seriously. And so there are going to be people this week that will get those that will find various things. Some, you were right in alignment and you grew in the ways that you wanted and others that you didn't grow. And the same thing for those of you that made resolutions last year, especially if you made spiritual resolutions of wanting to mature and to grow and to develop in God. And some of you did very well and some of you missed it. I've missed it in some areas, and I've grown in some areas, and I think that's how life goes. But we're going to discuss what that means in the context of Philippians 3 next week. You don't have to bring them with you. I'm not going to call anyone out. I'm not going to ask you to read them out loud to anybody. It's just between you and God. But I think it's important that we reflect back on that, and here's why. Because if you failed to grow in the way that you had hoped, confess it to God. I think if you failed in your resolutions, confess it to God. If you feel like you failed God specifically, confess it to him, repent. Repentance is not just saying, eh, sorry, I blew it again. Repentance is saying, I'm done doing it my way. I want to turn around and go God's way. If you failed to grow in the way that you wanted to grow, If you didn't quite make it to where you need to be, just as Paul said, I'm not quite where I want to be. If you're not there, confess it to him. Confess those shortcomings. Why? Because this is the beginning of life. This is the beginning of how we begin to live and not just exist. Existence says, eh, I'll try again next year. But life means I want to live through these. I'm going to confess these shortcomings. I'm going to repent to God And then accept the forgiveness that he has to offer because he's willing to forgive you no matter what it was, no matter how you've failed. This is our God. This is his heart. He's willing to forgive you for any of it. And that's good. And if you succeeded, celebrate it and share that with someone. But if you repent and you find that forgiveness, let me just tell you, the devil will not like that. And he will try to remind you of your failures. He will make it difficult for you to maybe forgive yourself. If God has forgiven you, you are free. If the Son has set you free, you are free indeed. And accept that forgiveness, forgive yourself, and continue to move and to grow. Don't let those things destroy you. James 4, 7 talks about submit to God and resist the devil and he'll flee. But that means put up a fight. Don't let him win anymore. Put up a fight. And by the way, don't put up the fight by yourself. Let's do it together. Isn't it easier to fight a battle together with people that say, we're on the same team, let's fight. Let's resist them together, let's do this. So going forward, let me ask you this. Would you be willing to commit to being fully devoted in 2016? And maybe you're not, maybe you're not there yet. But what will you be fully devoted to this year? Because I think ultimately we're fully devoted to something. Are we fully devoted to ourselves, to our self-interest? Are we fully devoted to know Christ? This is what Paul teaches us here. To be fully devoted to know him and to know the power of his resurrection. To know the power of Jesus. To know him personally and spiritually and to grow. What will you be fully devoted to in 2016? My hope is that just like Paul, you want to know him, but my hope is that you will live a life worthy of the calling that you have received. That's what Ephesians 4, 1 says. To live, not simply exist, but to live, to live a life worthy of the calling that Christ has for you. And if you don't think you have one, that's just the devil trying to sidetrack you. You're here and you have heard the calling. 
to be fully devoted. This is at least the calling. There's more to it, but this is at least where it begins. Will you live a life worthy of the calling you've received? That's really our theme for 2016. Live the life. Don't simply exist. Live the life worthy of the calling you've received. And then let's do that together. Let's do what's necessary. Not that you can work your way into it. It's not that we just try harder and out of my own personal toil, out of my own flesh, I'm going to make it better. No. See, this is the thing about being fully devoted. As God works in you, it's you cooperating with Him to allow Him to change and transform and to grow. And it does begin with recognizing that we have room to grow. Just like Paul says. And I haven't made it yet. And so my suggestion for you this week is pray about it this week, every day. Write it down. Put it in your phone. Make a reminder. Pray about it every week and ask God, what do you want me to work on this year with you? See, this is really where resolution should begin. Resolution shouldn't just be everybody has the same re- resolution. I want to lose weight. I want to exercise more. I want to get out of debt. I want to clean my garage or whatever. And it'd be nice if I could read my Bible more, pray more, give more, and serve more. That, that'll be nice. But see, that's not devotion. That's just falling into a line of existence. But instead... To really pray and ask God, what do you want me to work on? So what that it's January 3rd? There's nothing magical about making some commitment on January 1st, believe it or not. So here on January 3rd, let's begin the process of at least praying and saying, God, where, where do you want me this year? What do you want me to work on? Reveal it to me and then let's work on it together. Let's be devoted to one another. Uh, that's all throughout the Bible, by the way, especially in the New Testament, to be devoted to one another to walk this journey with each other, to lift each other up. And when you fail, we lift you up. And when you succeed, we celebrate. When you cry, we cry with you. And when you laugh, we laugh with you. That's what community's for. Let's do this together. And let's see what God wants to do with us as we go through this process that Paul lays out for us to make these resolutions a reality. And so here's the invitation to you today. The invitation is come and pray. It's a good place to start. You can sit right there if you want to and maybe begin to ask that question. God, what do, you, what do you want to work on in me this year? What do you want to change about me? I'm surrendered. I'm all in. What do you want to do with me? Maybe part of that prayer is help me to not just exist, but to really live. To live the life worthy. Oh, that word worthy is so important. But to live the life worthy of the calling that you've given me. What does it look like? What do you want to do in me this year? Maybe this is a good moment for you to take a few minutes and pray right there. If you need help and you don't know how to pray that prayer, I'll pray it over you. Just come up with me and I'll sit here and we'll pray together. Or maybe some of our other leaders, if a bunch of people come, we can just pray over you. Maybe it's time to be humble and get on your knees and pray. There's nothing wrong with that. Don't. Who cares what people think? But to pray. And then come to the cross. That is, come to the communion. This is how we remember the cross. The body broken and the blood shed. The bread that reminds us of the body. The cup that reminds us of the blood. Because it's in this that we receive the gift of life. Not just the gift of existence. But the gift of life. It's because of what Jesus does. And just like Paul says, let me know Christ and the power of the resurrection The resurrection isn't there without the death, and we understand the death, but also that he defeats death. Why? So that we too will defeat death and live, live forever, but also live, live now in light of that eternity. But to live, not just exist. It's because of the blood that we can experience things like Hebrews 9, verse 14 says, How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from the acts that lead to death so that we may serve a living God? Maybe some of you need to start the year off with a clear conscience to know that you can be washed clean. It begins with that surrendered heart that says, I'm all in. Help me to live, not just exist.
What do you want to work on in me? And I'm surrendered. You can do whatever you need to do in me. And it's a scary prayer. I know I've had to pray it many, many, many times. But to have that clear conscience. Maybe it's time to begin the year that way. Maybe it's time to begin the year in baptism. To be washed clean and begin a new life. To start brand new. But Jesus offers all this through his blood. Through the sacrifice. And so I invite you to pray today. Either with me or another leader. Maybe someone sitting next to you. Or just pray in your chair. Begin this dialogue. But don't let it just be today. Please be committed to praying this throughout the week. Go to the table and share communion with Jesus and with each other to take that bread and that cup and remember the sacrifice that gives us not existence but life. To live the life worthy of the calling that you've received. So there's communion stations all around the room. Take your time. And we can sing together and we can pray and we can commune. And then we'll come back together and I'll pray one last time and we'll finish up for the day. So let's do that now.